Hi, and welcome to the 12th House Podcast. I'm Michelle. What's up? I'm Wallace. And we're here to, we're here to spill some wellness tea on we, this Friday morning. Friday morning. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like to be in two places at once? <laughs> you know what? I'm digging it. I can already feel it's Friday. It must Friday. be in the chlorophyll. It must be in the chlorophyll. <laughs> <laughs> we're currently sipping on chlorophyll, but unfortunately the rest of the wellness world may not be so lucky. No, because it is sold out everywhere. As I was formed on my trip to Erwan earlier this week or on the weekend, I don't know what day it is. <laughs> Time's a flat circle. Exactly. Who cares? When I asked for chlorophyll drops and the lovely woman in the vitamin section was like, well, you and everybody else on TikTok. <laughs> so too bad. You fucking hipster. <laughs> yeah, because we're sold out. <laughs> oh, you think you're so special? <laughs> Think you're healthy and unique? She basically let me down very gently. She was very kind that the global supply chain of chlorophyll has been rocked because of a certain Kourtney Kardashian and a certain trending hashtag on TikTok. Courtney and her goddamn poosh. Yes, poosh. Did not know that was a thing, actually. Yeah, it's her, she it's her goop-like website where she talks about wellness because she's kind of a babe for being... I don't know, having like five kids and being in her 40s. Yeah. I would argue the plastic surgery has probably helped, but Mm. we can go with chlorophyll drops as the key to, I don't know, everlasting youth. I wonder if she got a mommy makeover, which is a term I'd never heard of (laughs) and wish I didn't know existed. (laughs) Google it yourself. Yeah. (laughs) At your own risk. It's like the swan over here in that show. (laughs) Oh, I'm still sort of traumatized by that show. Absolutely. We should all be (laughs) scarred. I feel like there should be some sort of like 30 for 30 podcast about the swan. Maybe like, we'll make go, it. Maybe it will be us. <laughs> but okay, so chlorophyll water is going viral, sold out everywhere. There's like 188 million uses of the hashtag chlorophyll water on TikTok. And um, is it worth it? Let me work it. We're actually about to talk about chlorophyll in the cost. We've been mm-hmm. prepping for this, honestly. We saw it coming. And specifically, Saqqara's chlorophyll water. Yeah, we actually got a bunch of people who requested that we review Saqqara's mm-hmm. chlorophyll water. And spoiler, you don't need to pay $39 for two ounces of chlorophyll water and two ounces of trace minerals. Trust me, that is a scam with capital S. Straight up robbery. S is for Saqqara and also scam. Yes. <laughs> Saqqara scam life. Yep. That's pretty much what's happening Please over there. Please don't us. <laughs> it also starts with an S. <laughs> I mean, damn, they're making bank on that upcharge. Over they there. are making bank in more ways than one. Sakara also mm-hmm. just got $15 million of investment, which is super interesting because it means that they're doing well enough to get a lot of investment. Mm-hmm. And I just heard about Sakara on, actually, weirdly in a commercial on Goop's latest podcast, which I thought was super weird because Goop, if you follow the cusp, you know that Goop just launched their cloud kitchen, Goop Kitchen, and they're doing meal delivery services in LA. And that's kind of a competitor of Saqqara. So to hear Saqqara getting promoted on Goop was like a bit funny to me. And I also never listen to the Goop podcast because I generally think it's boring. No offense, Goop. Sorry, that's my, that's my take. But Erica Chitty was the guest on the podcast, and Gwyneth announced that Erica Chitty, who's the CEO of Loom, will be taking over as her co-host on the Goop podcast. Wallace, what are your thoughts? Well, I'm wondering if there is any relationship between the Sakara Kitchen and the Goop Ghost Kitchen. I wonder if they use the same suppliers or they use the same kitchen, if that's all related, if they're going to get acquired by Goop. Potentially. Mm-hmm. I think that Goop just mm-hmm. swallowing Sakara up whole could definitely make sense. And potentially, if that is something that Sakara has been talking about with Goop, it could be a reason that investors would want to invest. Mm-hmm. If they know that there's some sort of acquisition play in the future. But I don't know. Well, Saqqara just seems like more of the same (laughs) in terms of same, same category of what they're already doing. But Erica Chidi joining the podcast is really interesting because that seems more like, oh, we're 
taking stock of the content that we have, the people that we have, and we're deciding to go in a different direction and yeah. include other voices, which is great. Yeah. But- I mean, arguably like the biggest problem with Goop is not only Gwyneth Paltrow's just like complete and total avoidance of like what an out of touchness with like what it's like to be a person experiencing well being. It's also like Goop has been so geared towards rich than white people, yeah. straight white people. Yeah. And so to bring another voice in, Erica Chitty is gay black woman. Yeah. Or queer black woman, I should say, is great. I mean, like, that's good news. Yeah. And it sounds like Gwyneth genuinely really loves her and they have had an ongoing relationship. But I also thought it was a bit strange to mm-hmm. be like totally honest because mm-hmm. Goop has 200 employees. Are you really telling me that there's nobody inside of Goop who already works there who could have been promoted to take over at least Lowen's spot mm-hmm. co-hosting the podcast? Mm-hmm. Just seems like an interesting sort of move to take someone who doesn't work for your company mm-hmm. and ask them to take a giant stake in what you do, which is media and get this whole platform for themselves. And yeah. so we did some digging. Mm-hmm. Do you want me to reveal the digging? Reveal. Okay. We reveal did some away. digging. And Erica Chitty raised $3 million for Loom, which is her women's and birthing bodies fertility company around this time last year. And there's a mutual investor in Goop and in Loom, Slow Ventures. Slow obviously led the seed round, maybe not obviously led the round for Erica's company loom. And they also were, I think an investor in the series a of goop, which means they were pretty early in goop. The fact that they're aligning these two brands is super interesting to me. I wonder why they're positioning together other than the fact that they have mutual investors, which is always really useful. Potentially this could be something that I don't know, Erica asked for of slow ventures for like intros to goop and intros to Gwyneth. But I'm curious to like kind of understand what Goop gets out of it. Well, yeah. I also feel like that can be a situation at my previous tech job, the amount of partnerships, events, and things that we did because it was like, well, the investors are also investors in them. So we got to do X, Y, Z. But it seems like there's also obviously a, a mutual like connection between the two of them. But I think what also Goop gets out of it is a lot of what, erica represents like just on a purely pr basis yeah yeah and i think like don't get us wrong i think it's amazing that they're bringing erica in and we have to just look at everything as a transaction because Mm -hmm. that's what business is it's Mm -hmm. transactional relationships that's what everything is everything is a transaction really that doesn't mean that it has malintent just Mm -hmm. is like well what does this person get out of this and what does the other party get out of it and Mm -hmm. i also wonder just because goop has been focused so much on sexual health for the last year they just launched their own line of sex toys yeah and that's a lot about of what loom talks about it talks about sexual well-being and fertility and stuff like that yeah if there's something there if there's Mm -hmm. some collaboration coming if there's potentially an acquisition coming like what might be down the pipe for both of them goop is gonna make fertility products oh i wouldn't be surprised if they already have yeah they didn't already have a supplement and they're gonna launch with erica that makes sense. I don't know. That's just I a guess. I see it. I mean, Goop has the infrastructure, right? Yeah. They, They're they set up for everything. They've, mm-hmm. worked, they've covered beauty. They've covered sex. Like, yeah. The natural progression will be fertility. Yeah, and I'd argue what they're missing is the expertise mm-hmm. and, like, the mm-hmm. people actually taking them seriously. The because, social cred. Yeah, exactly. And that's what Erica has in spades as a doula, as an author mm-hmm. of a book about the fourth trimester. And, and on an intersectional basis. Mm-hmm, exactly. So... Interesting. Watch that space. Mm -hmm. Curious to see what happens. Also, like maybe I'll actually start listening to the Goop podcast now. Yeah. Who knows? No, I I would love to hear. I haven't heard her ever interview anyone. I think I've seen her do a few talks. So I'm curious. When you said talks, I immediately thought TikToks and I thought you were shorting (laughs) TikTok to talk. And I was like, wow, yeah, talks. That's what the youth are saying. Yeah. (laughs) I I represent the youth. (laughs) She's one year younger than me, ladies and gentlemen. I am the youth <laughs> on this podcast. The talks. <laughs> These days on the talks. <laughs> Actually, speaking of TikToks, I think the next people that we're about to talk to tried to make a foray into TikTok and it didn't work, go very well. Dude, I saw my friend Sneaky Way sent me a TikTok that of Rama this weekend. Yeah. Guru Jagat had guns that shot money out of them and she was coming emerging from an elevator 
much like Neo in The Matrix, but instead of bullets, it was money. And was it unbecoming? Maybe. Maybe. Was it a little... It was a little awkward. <laughs> yeah. Awkward, yeah. Yeah, I'd say a little awkward. <laughs> <laughs> was any of it good? <laughs> the cringe factor was high, I would mm-hmm. say. Not because I don't love when ma- women make money. Like, yeah. I'm not against that. And just, like, I don't know. I'm not really, like, a prosperity gospel type of person. I also feel like the, like, meme in general of money guns, throwing money, <laughs> like, that's just very, I don't know, 2000. I'm like, who are you, 11? DJ Khaled? Like, yeah. what is this? What's happening here? <laughs> you just don't do that anymore. Listen, stop trying to make it a thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I drove past Rama this weekend because Ian and I were in Venice. It was interesting. First time in a year and a half. It's so much. And drove past Rama, saw some little cult members outside, and it made me really just go down the rabbit hole of what's going on on Rama because I don't know, have you followed the account Rama Wrong? I I think you sent it to me the first time I saw it, and I looked at it a little bit, but I haven't been following it recently. I think maybe that was where I saw that she like didn't pay people essentially for labor. She yeah. like had a harem situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all hearsay, but they pretty much like shown evidence on this Instagram account, Rama Wrong, which popped up like around this time, I feel like, mm. last year. And Rama is a Kundalini studio based in Venice. Guru Jagat is the charismatic founder at the center of it. And mm. she is calls herself Guru Jagat. Her real name is Katie Griggs. And yeah, there's some like really shady stuff that's happened there. And I would argue that Kundalini yoga is cool. I definitely practiced it for a while and like some of the mantras, but it's super problematic and has become super problematic because of its founder, Yogi Bhajan, Mm -hmm. who around this time again last year, many people came forward with evidence of his abuse, physical, emotional, sexual abuse of his followers, of women, of children. And since then, the Kundalini community has kind of been like, whoa, all up in it. There's a really good podcast episode on Kundalini and on Rama in general on the Conspirituality podcast. So if you want to like double click on that, maybe do it. But some of the recent stuff that Rama Wrong has posted about Guru Jagat is pretty brutal. It's like direct screenshots of her abusing, verbally abusing, or textually abusing her employees, which is really? wild. I need to check that out. I was, just while you were talking about Yogi Bhajan, I was thinking about, and I think they talk about this a lot on the Conspirituality podcast, potentially, the book that came out of one of his ex, like, closest. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The White Golden Bird Cage. in a Golden Cage, My Life with Yogi Bhajan. Yeah. It's really interesting. And like this kind of lines up with QAnon shit because Mm -hmm. Kelly Brogan, who Mm -hmm. is, so when this book came out, it like caused such a stir in the Kundalini community because a lot of people were like, Yogi Bhajan never did that. He's like a god. And everyone else, not everyone else, a lot of people were like, whoa, shit. Yeah. He's a sex abuser. Mm -hmm. And like Kundalini's having a Me Too moment. Mm -hmm. And Kelly Brogan, who is now this QAnon conspiracy total like pastel Q wellness person wrote this article about like how we victimize ourselves and how it was so problematic in so many ways. Mm. And it really like made all my red flags go off personally. Mm. And, and now to see the evolution of Kelly Brogan is fascinating. Well, I'm curious to see how this all affects Guru Jaga and Rama in general, because they have a pretty global following I used to go to classes for sure. Yeah. I mean, not a lot, but it was a little just like too culty for me <laughs> in the end. <laughs> so, yeah. You're like, I'm literally drinking the Kool-Aid as yeah. they're like passing out tea at the end of class where you're yeah. just like, yeah, I just like sat in this room and medic- meditated and uh, yeah, there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot we could probably go way deeper into That's it, true. but the fact that it's a bunch of white women appropriating Sikh culture who Mm -hmm. really do not pay homage to Sikh culture Mm -hmm. and are like completely separate of that tradition and religion and like just huddle together themselves. I mean, I'm pretty sure 90% of people who work at Rama are white women Mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with converting to a different religion, but that's not what they're doing. And that in and of itself seems like (laughs) tricky, tricky territory. Like, should you be wearing a 
I don't know if you should be wearing a turban. I don't know. And also, there's just a lot of questionable things happening with that whole crew. What's his name? With the really long white beard. Her other. Oh, yeah. Harry Jeevan. Yeah, Harry Jeevan. Like, he went to prison for fraud. Exactly. <laughs> the toner bandit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The toner bandit. Exactly. <laughs> and then even when you dig into Yogi Bhajan's history and what he was doing before. He, he also was committing fraud and was, was also yeah. like a scam artist. Yeah. Yeah. It's all fraud. I don't yeah. know. You guys wellness is a scam. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> this is the scam podcast. <laughs> the LA Wellness Scam Podcast. Welcome. <laughs> but you know what is not a scam? Our next news item. <laughs> the big chill. <laughs> yeah. D- decidedly not a scam because the yogurt is delicious. I must admit, I've never been. I'm just making that. I feel like now I need to take you I, there. Yeah. No. It feels like a rite of passage, apparently, in LA. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you the line is so long because Demi Lovato put the big chill on blast on her Instagram for perpetuating diet culture because when she was checking out at the Big Chill, which is a small independent froyo shop in West LA, she saw some cookies that said guilt free on them and she went on a bit of a rant on her Instagram about how problematic that was for someone in recovery like her and how the Big Chill was perpetuating diet culture. Why them? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like it's a bit rude. I mean, the conversation around it, because I feel, uh, you know, by the time, you know, this is released on Friday, who knows what the new developments will be right, right. between now and then. <laughs> but I think the thing that stuck out to me that's interesting about the whole conversation around it is the idea that, you know, we should be condemning anything that's like fat free or sugar free or, and, you know, it spawned that whole discussion around diet culture. But, I think one of the things we've been talking about at holisticism in general is like, what is the gray zone? Where are the nuances? And moving away from very binary black and white thinking. And especially when it comes to food and diet culture, that's really hard because that doesn't work very well to sell products. Mm -hmm. To be like a little balance, a little bit of this, (laughs) a little bit of that. (laughs) It's true. It doesn't. That's like not marketing. That's not good, quote unquote, good marketing. Yeah. Because like what gets people to buy usually are things like scarcity tactics Mm -hmm. or the opposite, like pie in the, sky, in the sky, this could be your life. Too good, good to be true, right? It's ice cream with no fat in it. It's healthy ice cream. It has zero sugar in it. It's like, hmm, that sounds awesome. It's going to give you explosive diarrhea because malatol. But like, <laughs> well, it's like that company Halo Top ice cream. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea what's in it. I haven't had it, but it was like essentially like zero calorie ice cream yeah no it's it's like really low calorie ice cream also their scam is that they only fill it like three quarters of the way oh the pint it's It's like (laughs) they should just start selling like pints that have just the bottom filled (laughs) yeah it's like this is all 200 calories this whole pint is only 200 calories and you're like that's right because the rest is air exactly (laughs) yeah i think that Demi's obviously getting a lot of flack. Mm -hmm. I don't think the people rallied around her in the way that she expected. I think that she thought she was being like righteous and good and calling out diet culture. The news cycle that is not kind to her. No, no, it's kind of weird. I mean, like I would say it's probably misogyny. Yeah. Is why like the news cycle is like not kind to her. Kind of can't catch a break, but also she kind of steps in it a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Why? Just this know. little mom and pop shot. I know. Of all the places. Yeah, like, she should have taken down, like, who's worth, like, Weight Watchers or, yeah. like, Snackwell cookies, you yeah. know? Or, yeah. like, I don't know, something, like, way worse than this tiny retro yogurt shop that's in L.A. And, like, nobody who, except the people who live around it care about it. Like, yeah. Just so weird. Yeah. But I also, like, kind of feel for her, and I get what she was saying. She was, like, going off about Mm guilt-free. And she was like, nothing should give you guilt. That's food. And I don't don't think that's wrong. Like, but that's – it's so hard, as you said, to, like, remove the diet culture out of Well, saying stuff like that, like, just very – I don't know what's the word, but even that kind of exclamation is just kind of asking for – attention right Mm -hmm. everything should be guilt-free it's like but that's not really the world we live in right and it doesn't acknowledge the decades of food shaming and diet culture yeah so i feel like that's not really like grounded in reality it's like you're just asking for a reaction at that point right right yeah and 
And like a lot of people were coming for the big chill, you know, on like white nighting for the big chill. And mm-hmm. they're like, sugar free is really important for people with diabetes or people yeah. who are trying to stay in keto. And like fat free is important for people who have high cholesterol mm-hmm. and like other whatever. I think if you have gout, like you're not supposed to eat high fat, but I don't know how many people have gout, but regardless, I know like, someone with gout. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I thought when they told me it, they said scurvy. <laughs> I feel like you're a pirate. Yeah, it was like, he kind of is kind of like a pirate. I mean, yeah, yeah. Gout was like what King Edward yeah, had, it's like the one who killed all his wives, or King Henry, the guy who killed all his wives. The disease of excess. Yeah, gout. yeah. <laughs> just means you have high uric acid, that's mm. all. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I'm surprised that the internet was like, no, we're going to save the big chill, mm-hmm. and we're going to throw Demi under the bus, because mm-hmm. I kind of see where she's coming from. She sounds a little self-righteous, she's mm-hmm. a little out of touch, but... But also, like, I'm, ha- I'm not trying to do the right thing, I guess. I guess. Just not really, like, maybe appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> but th- I think this was on Twitter, maybe. I'm forgetting. No, it was Instagram. These aren't spaces where, like, you're going to have nuanced conversation. No. Anyways. Like, it's really going to go one way or the other. <laughs> like, no. which team is going to win? <laughs> yeah. It's like, do you want to have a conversation? Then don't puck- fucking put something on the internet. Yeah. Like, have a podcast. And then have a one-way conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Make people listen to you. <laughs> yeah, so jury's out on Demi, but I think the jury's in on the big chill and we're voting for it. And you will have to take me there? And I will have to take you there. <laughs> and that's it. It's that's a lot our, of L.A. stories. It is. Sorry. It's, it's Inside Baseball. We're trying a new thing. So let us know if you like the wellness news. We do news like this inside of the cusp every other week where you can hear the things that we're reading and listening and thinking about. And we think it's helpful to just peek behind the curtain and help you see that, hey, look, all these companies are connected Mm -hmm. or all these companies are a scam. And here's why. Or not. Whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Or not. Who knows? (laughs) You mean you you do you. But if you want to learn more, you can join the cost. It's $5 a month. You get lots of cool other delightful things like product reviews and white papers Mm -hmm. and lots and lots of job listings every single month. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the wellness industry or wellness adjacent industry or just like a wellness hype beast, I think you'd love joining the cusp. And if there are things that you want us to like touch on specifically in these Friday episodes, like news, anything in the news or things that are trending in the industry and you want us to cover it here or in the cusp, send us a text Mm -hmm. at 818-699-9735. Yeah, we love a deep throat moment. If you've got, if you've got, give it, <laughs> ready for it. You've got some hot tips. Tickle the tonsils. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let us know. We won't, we won't blow up your spot. We love a tip, you know, about a news story. Let's talk about increasing your failure tolerance. <laughs> okay, let's talk about failure tolerance. I just had this great class coffee talk and conversation about quantum leaping timeline collapsing and you know like light saturday conversation and there was such a cool group of people thanks for everyone who came and we talked about five different ways to collapse the timeline and when i say collapse the timeline or quantum leap i mean that but i also mean get a result more quickly and with more ease right imagine two points on a timeline and the middle of the timeline falling out from underneath them and those two points just coming together and kissing and that happening quickly and with ease without more work without more stress without more efforting and I think that's really possible in a lot of situations in our lives, probably more often than we might realize. I don't think it's applicable across the board, but for a lot of stuff, we can apply the quantum leap, timeline collapsing, some of these methods we talked about in order to get what we want more quickly to accelerate. And one of those key things is increasing our failure tolerance. Most of us think that we have a high failure tolerance, but actually have a very low failure tolerance. I can personally attest to this. You know, I grew up studying dance and being a dancer. And so I went to lots of auditions. I got lots of rejections. I thought I had a really high failure tolerance. You know, I was used to people saying, yeah, you're not good for this part because you're too fat. You're not good enough. You can't turn, you can't jump and you have bad feet. (laughs) I was like, cool, bye. I'm going to go get a coffee. 
I thought that I just had like awesome self-esteem and really high confidence and really high self-worth. And I thought I had a really high failure tolerance. And the truth was I might've had those other things, but I definitely didn't have a high failure tolerance. And that was because I'm such a perfectionist. I don't know if anyone out there can relate to being a perfectionist, but I would put myself, although I thought I had very high self-esteem and could sort of let things roll off my back. I would put myself in situations where I either knew that I was going to succeed, like without a shadow of a doubt, or I would put myself in situations where I knew it was nearly impossible for me to succeed. And so I pretty much assumed that I would fail and it didn't even feel like a failure because it felt like a foregone conclusion. It felt like, well, this is obvious, you know, it'd be like going to a casting call where they're asking for like a six foot tall blonde, you know, <laughs> like I'm not, I'm five foot two. <laughs> like I'm, that's not going to happen. And the stakes were very low. And I want to repeat that again. I had a very low failure tolerance because I put myself in the position where I either knew that I was going to succeed or I knew it was absolutely impossible for me to succeed. And I think most of us fall into that category of putting ourselves up for jobs or opportunities or in situations where we're like, I'm pretty confident that this is going to work in my favor. And also putting ourselves in situations and saying we're taking a quote unquote risk by doing something that's nearly impossible. And then sort of patting ourselves on the backs and saying, yep, oh yeah, I always, I'm risky. I'm, I'm really putting myself out there, right? <laughs> And that's good. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like keep, keep going with your bad self, but that doesn't mean that you have high failure tolerance. High failure tolerance means failing, <laughs> putting yourself in the position to fail multiple times, not just once, multiple times, often. And yes, failure sucks. <laughs> failure for many of us feels like dying. Failure and rejection. We can kind of use those terms interchangeably. And when you get rejected, when you get turned down, when you fail at something publicly in front of other people, it's mortifying. It's so shaming, right? Like, have you ever been ghosted <laughs> and felt like your insides like turned to putty and also fell out of your butt? Like, it's the worst feeling in the world. And that's why we avoid failure because we're avoiding the feeling of dying. We're afraid to die. Most of us. <laughs> Everyone except the Scorpios out there. We're afraid to die. It makes sense because we're very much alive. <laughs> we like it here for the most part. And we don't know what's beyond this. And that death, that dying can be really scary. So we don't put ourselves in the position to get close to it or to feel anything like what it might feel like to die. And so that means we don't often put ourselves in the way of failure. And you're like, okay, Pelson, but what does this have to do with quantum leaping? <laughs> and here's what it does. When we fail and when we fail often and when we consciously fail, when we learn from our failures, we accelerate our growth and our trajectory at an exponential speed. We learn so fast when we fail because we feel it so deeply because it's very sensational for us. And because it's usually something that we've never done before. And we don't learn quickly. We don't have accelerated learning in our day-to-day -day life because much of our day-to-day -day life is doing the same thing over and over again, or just like doing the same thing at a 1% higher rate or like 1% better. And listen, I'm all for being 1% better every single day. Like that's one of my favorite books, Atomic Habits. That's what the author talks about how can you be 1% better every day because at the end of the year, you'll be 365% better. And that's really good. <laughs> like 365% growth is really good, right? And if we're talking about quantum leaps, we're not talking about improving in percentages. We're talking about improving in like exponentials, you know, at like 10x. Instead of incrementally improving, we're exponentially improving. So when we fail, we're putting ourselves in the position of trying something pretty new, something we've probably never done before, failing and learning from it and failing intelligently. So taking that learning and applying it and going out again. And instead of being butthurt and making it personal and making it about us when we fail, we're actually 
taking all that juicy goodness of the fail of the embarrassment, which by the way, like we have nothing to be really embarrassed or ashamed about. The only thing that we should be not should be the only thing that we might feel ashamed about is not just getting back out there and trying again. You know, it's when it really like beats us down and we don't get up and show up again. Maybe that's when shame might rear its head, but may also maybe not. We don't really need to have shame in our vocabulary anymore. Unless we're really hurting people, then maybe shame is appropriate. But I would argue even then, shame doesn't really work as a way to change people fundamentally, in, in my opinion. But we can double click on that later. So how, why failure tolerance? Well, because it helps you create a quantum leap. The more you fail and the more consciously you fail and, and intelligently you, you fail, the faster you're going to learn, the faster you're going to get to what you want. So I want you to just do a gut check for yourself right now on a scale of one to 10, one being I literally never put myself out there to fail and 10 being I fail all day long. I eat failure for breakfast. I am constantly putting myself out there to fail. Where do you fall between one and 10? And maybe you're a one, <laughs> maybe you're like, I think I'm a three, but maybe the more you think about it, you're like, well, I don't know, maybe I'm a two, but where are you on that scale? And then I just want you to think about increasing your failure tolerance by like, two integers. So if you're at a three, go up to a five. If you're five, go to a seven. If you're seven, go to a nine. How does that feel? What would that look like? How would you increase your failure tolerance day to day? So often in intuitive business, people want to increase the amount of sales that they're making, right? The amount of revenue that they're getting. And what many people don't realize is that in order to sell something, you have to get rejected a lot. <laughs> like you get rejected more than you get yeses. You know, if you have a 2% conversion rate, that means that two people said yes and a group of 198 people said no. <laughs> so can you imagine how high your failure tolerance would have to be if you wanted to go from making, I don't know, $1,000 a week to $5,000 a week? Part of what you'd need to do is increase your failure tolerance and get rejected more because you're also going to get more yeses. In order to get more yeses, you have to get more no's, right? So in order to create a quantum leap, you've got to increase your failure tolerance. And it sounds simple because it is simple and it might make you kind of want to throw up. It does make me want to throw up a little bit. And every time I'm reminded of increasing my failure tolerance, I'm like, yeah, damn it. Yeah, I have to do that because it's really easy to get comfortable and confident and do the things that you know you're good at, right? Especially when they work for you. And I'm not saying that we always need to be stretching and trying to do better, be better, grow more exponentially, but sometimes that's what we want. Sometimes that's what we need. We don't need it all the time. We don't have to constantly be on this quest for betterment. But if you're in a position where maybe you're feeling stuck or maybe you're feeling quote unquote blocked and you want to get unstuck, one of the best ways to get unstuck is to increase your failure tolerance and start failing. Put yourself out there and see what happens. And then remember, the most important thing about a failure tolerance is just taking what you learn and applying it intelligently. We're not failing and flailing just to fail and flail. We're failing with good reason to make that quantum leap. So I can't wait to hear how increasing your failure tolerance goes. Let me know by shooting me a text at the Holisticism line or jumping into the Holisticism hub, which is our free community, and letting me know how it goes for you. I'd love to support you on your journey. And with that, I will see you all on the internet. Take care. Bye.